loving us. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die on a cruel death on the cross for us. So Lord, we thank you for this time we have to come together and study from our word. We pray that we'll have open hearts and open minds and, and you know, prick our hearts and lead us to live a life for thee. Do we ask that you be with those that was on the list of people we talked about sick. We ask that you wrap your loving arms around them as only you can, and we ask that you heal them. Do Lord, we ask you to be with those that are taking care of them. We ask you to be with their family members because we know that it's hard on them also. And we ask that you comfort them. Do Lord, we ask that you be with our church here. We ask you to be with the church all over the world. We know that they're having difficult times, and we pray that we'll look to thee because you are the one that can comfort us and lead us in the right direction. Do Lord, we ask that you be with our elders as they lead the church. We know they are in a different times also. We know that we need to be considerate of them and their decisions that they have to make because it's new territory. We ask that, that we will be behind them and their decisions and follow them. And pray that their decisions are always towards thee. Do Lord, we ask that you be with us throughout the rest of our lives and bring us home in heaven with thee. Christ, and we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In our discussion the last couple of weeks, we have taken Paul through his introduction of the resurrection. This is the discussion that I have preached to you, that you receive, by which you stand and are saved. Uh, then he went on to describe the witnesses over there. So he, he made the case for this is the content, the, the, the uh, foundation of our preaching. And Jesus was witnessed by many people having been raised from the dead. So he's gone through a great deal of time to create this discussion of the importance of the resurrection. And now he is ready to make application to it that we will take on this morning. Now, before we go any farther, I want to describe the importance of the concept of if-then. How many programmers do we have in here? Only one? Nobody writes code except Tracy? You don't work on spreadsheets? Excel? Okay, if you write a formula in Excel, surely at some point in time, you have used one of the discriminating formulas built in. And whether you knew it or not, if it's going to count up boxes, if it's going to relocate information to somewhere else, copy something by itself, then it has an if-then statement built into it. If this box has a content, then you put it over here. If this has a number, then you do this with it. You divide it, subtract it, multiply it, divide it, whatever. It's got if-then statements built in it. If then is the primary tool. It is the beginning, it's the underpinning of everything that has to do with logic. If a certain condition is there, then a response will follow. And then you test for that condition. What condition are you looking for? If the room is too hot, then cool it down. we want to cool it down. If it's too cold, then Libby will put on a sweater. <laughs> she'll put a sweater on anyway. Yeah, I know. But, you know, <laughs> give her a benefit of the doubt. Uh, if then. All right. So Paul's going to use an if then nested series. What does nested mean? Nested means you got one after another. Sometimes you have an if then statement inside an if then statement. And maybe another one inside an if then statement. So that you do a multiple condition check. And this is all logic. This is what we do when we, we plan out something. If it's going to rain, then we need to postpone our picnic. If it's going to be cold outside, then I need to wear a coat. Or I may want to drive my car instead of my motorcycle. Or whatever. So, if then is a part of everything we do in life, whether you know it or not. So, Paul is going to use this. 
After that, he was seen by James, verse 7, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called, be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, there's a couple of weeks worth of discussion there in Paul's life, but we're going to let that slide and continue with our discussion. Verse 12. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, we need to understand Paul's use of the word if. If the sun is shining outside, if the sun came up this morning, then it is a new day. Is there really any doubt that the sun came up? No, there's not. There's no question as to whether or not the sun came up. It is a certainty. And Paul was not disputing whether or not it was the case Christ was actually raised from the dead. That is a given. That's the whole point. We preached it. We saw him. We saw him dead. We saw him alive. This was something that was well documented by everybody. It is a known fact. So he's established it as fact. Okay? So, we have a fact established... <laughs> Beyond doubt. So when Paul says, if Christ has been raised, he's not disputing it at all. There's no doubt. He's attaching it to the logic of it. If Christ has been raised, then there is something that we have to consider. What's his first if-then argument? If Christ has been raised, then how is it that some of you say there is no resurrection. What some of you does he think you're talking to? Is he talking to people in the church? Yes. Yes. Was this one of the questions that came up to him? Just don't, just don't know for sure. But on this topic, and it seems like a fundamental topic for becoming a Christian, the set of questions that he had to answer for the Corinthians, do you think this is one of them? Truly, I don't. Okay. I don't think it's one of them because um, if there was a dispute regarding the resurrection, you know, how would that come as a question? Dear Paul, are you telling us that Christ really did rise from the dead? That seems like an unusual question. Now, the ones that he describes, and he said, concerning the questions you wrote unto me, yeah, they wrote questions on how they should deal with certain topics, how they should handle uh, issues between them, things of that sort. But I really don't think this is one of the questions they wrote. But do I know that for a fact? Nope, I don't. No, he answers this in full length. But the fact that we have, what, 54 verses? That's uh, No, 58 in our, in our chapter. Uh, you know, I'm looking at my Bible in print, and uh, it goes from that column all the way over to that column. So I've got one and a half full pages of my Bible given over to a single topic. That's a lot of material for Paul to be addressing. So this is a really, really big deal. This, go ahead. I can't understand how you call yourself Christians and not believe he arose from the dead. We couldn't. That's because, be useless for beer if we didn't believe that. that's because you are where you are, and they are where they are. We, we have had all of our lives, all of us who are Christians and have been associated with the knowledge of the Bible and Christianity, have a recognition that Christ's resurrection has been an accepted historical fact, at least among Christians, for 2,000 years. That may be a little push. But 1,900 years, there was no debate past the first century. So all of those who would fall into the category of Christianity. But Paul is not dealing with Christians of our time. 
He's dealing with people who have never heard of this before in their lives. This was the very first generation of people changing from paganism, from Judaism to Christianity. This was brand spanking new. And it's a tough town to do that. Oh, no, it is. This is a tough town. Yeah, this is a very tough town. How many of you drive cars? How many people drove cars in 1901? <laughs> when did a steam car come out? Late 18s? Very, very early 19? Somewhere along in there. Okay, how many of them were there around? Not that many. Well, by the time Henry Ford comes along and decides to put a flipper in everybody's garage, cars become fairly well accepted. But there was a transition period in there where the people who were riding horses hated cars and the people who drove cars were weird. Now it's accepted. We don't think anything about it. They had come from a society. There was no resurrection from the dead until Jesus came who was raised from the dead. Nobody. Who did you talk about people being raised from the dead? Nobody. Didn't exist. You know, the concept of some aspect of eternal life was a part of many religious con ideas. The uh, Egyptians and some others but generally speaking this was not a well known thought so when the preaching of Jesus resurrection from the dead and nobody living ever died and came back didn't happen so this is brand spanking new okay you're telling me this guy was killed by the Romans on a cross put in a grave and he came back to life are you kidding me that's what they're dealing with Chip well two things I think we're dealing with people that are ignorant and cynics. So I think he's dealing almost with two different... By ignorant, you mean just ignorant, uninformed, uninformed, not realizing foolish, silly. that right. the, the death, burial, and resurrection is tied to reconciliation to God, and they're still learning the... I mean, how some would of these they? people... How would they know that? Exactly. And some of these people are... Remember, it's just a short time ago. They weren't even supposed to be around a Gentile, intermarry with a Gentile. Well, these are Jews. We're talking about Corinthians. That they're they're pagans. Right, but what I'm saying is they're even these worse. Two groups together is right. just a yeah. You know, these people were like, wait a minute, you can't even like the woman at the well. Right. I mean, there's a short time period when you couldn't even be together. All this transitional stuff is really happening. Right. And you know. We know some about people it. are wondering why Christ isn't even back yet. You know, if you like the Thessalonians and stuff. So there's there's a lot of mis, I think, ignorance and cynics pulling the 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 people that are just ignorant away. But because of the scriptures, we know more about Jesus today than they knew about him when they were with him. Exactly. Say that again loudly. I said because of the scriptures, we know more about Jesus than the people that actually saw him. Do you understand that? We know more about the Lord than the people did of the first century. If we do, then we don't have to. Good question. <laughs> they had none of this knowledge. Now, they had snippets and pieces of first-hand knowledge, and they had second-hand knowledge from sources, but they did not know what you know. You've got the whole thing start to finish. From creation all the way to revelation, you understand God's plan. Peter didn't know that. It would be revealed gradually over time. Peter on the day of Pentecost says to those who ask, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. For the Lord our God will give salvation to who? To as many as the Lord our God, to those who are near and to those who are far off. Now when, Paul, when Peter said as many as are near are those who are far off, what was he describing? Those who were Jews and those who were Gentiles. Now did Peter understand the significance of his statement? Not yet, no. Not no, he did not. The Holy Spirit was providing this information for him. He was using, by the power of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and 
Jesus promised them he will remind you of all truth. He will guide you into things that you have not yet understood. And he will give you all utterance. Put that in our language. He's going to fill up your mouth with the words you're going to speak. Jesus told his disciples, do not worry about what you will say in that day. It will be given to you. So Peter's up here like a microphone. The Holy Spirit's speaking in his head and he's spouting it out. Yeah, that's exactly what's taking place in Acts chapter 2. Does Peter understand all of this? Nope. This is all brand new. All brand new. All right, so how do we, how do we get there? Let's go to, you know, Acts chapter 10. When uh, Cornelius, um, a Roman centurion, a good man, that's not, not a, he's not a Christian, he's a good man, he's moral, he's sound, he's compassionate, he's, he does not, uh, he's not involved in immoral things. He, there were many people who were known as God-fearers who lived in the Rome, were part of the Roman Empire. They were drawn to the monotheistic morals of Judaism. Now, in order to really appreciate this, you've got to understand what the Roman gods were like. The Roman gods had orgies. The Roman gods ripped the heads off their stories, ripped the heads off of people just for the fun of it. The Roman gods were jealous. The Roman gods had affairs with one another. The Roman gods were, they were as immoral as the people in their stories. The Jews had a God that is above all gods. He is the creator of all things, the sustainer of worlds. He called for his people to be just, to be righteous, to be holy. Did they live up to that? No, they didn't. But nonetheless, they had the law. And there was a great number of people who followed that because Judaism taught a single, powerful, creator God with morals. And they were drawn to it. Cornelius is one of them. He worships God. Who is another one? Acts chapter 8. We don't know him by name. Ethiopian. Ethiopian eunuch. He travels up from Africa to come to Jerusalem to worship God. Why? He's not Jewish. No, but he knows about the Jewish God. He has scriptures. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. This is a guy who wants to follow this God. All right. So, Cornelius is, is praying to God. He is living for God, and God reaches out to him and gives him a message from an angel. Send for a guy who's living at the house of a guy named Simon, a tanner in Joppa, and have him come here, and he's going to tell you something you need. Why didn't the angel tell Cornelius what to do to be saved? First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.21 God thro chose through preaching to save those who believe. There is no instruction from any being other than a human being telling us what we need to be saved. God made sure that was the case. So when Joseph Smith starts talking about all the stuff that somebody whispered in their ear, telling him what he needed to do, hogwash. Well, were you there? I don't have to be there. I know what God's plan is. Show me a counterfeit bill. How do I know it's a counterfeit bill? Who made it? I don't know. Where did it come from? I don't know. Well, maybe it's really good. Doesn't matter. If I know what the real thing is, the other one's obviously counterfeit. If it's different, it's not from God. Okay? So, Cornelius gets this message. He says, send to Joppa. Get this guy. Peter comes. Peter's not going to go. Peter gets a knock on the door, but before he gets a knock on the door, he gets a message from God. He's upstairs waiting for lunch, and uh, he falls into a trance, and he sees the vision. What's the vision? Oh, yeah. Peter, All right. So there's this big sheet that's let down. It's held at four corners, and it's full of animals. All right. So he's got this, this whole herd of animals in front of him in this big thing. Peter's hungry. He's up there on the, the top waiting for lunch. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Rise, Peter. Peter, kill and eat. And inside that sheet are clean animals and unclean animals. What could Jews eat? Not barbecue. Well, they could eat sheep. Okay. They could eat goats. They could eat cows. Deer. They could eat... 
Yeah. And goats and deer. Yeah. yeah, they could eat goats. They could eat deer. What else could they eat? Split hook, two could. Certain birds could they eat fish. Bones. Bones had scales. They could eat fish. Could they eat catfish? Nope. No, you can't have a catfish dinner. Quick story in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> we're fishing with a friend of mine at a place. And uh, we're fishing in this pond. He says, you don't have to worry about any catfish in this place. I said, why that? He said, because there aren't any catfish in this. I said, how do you know? He said, because the guy's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and he dug it, and he's not about to have a catfish in here. I said, well, that's cool. <laughs> anyway, we caught a lot of fish. It was a good day. Uh, so... Here's Peter, and there's, there's clean and unclean animals in this sheep. And God says, or the, the, uh, uh, the vision says, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I, I am not eating some of the animals that are in there. I have never eaten anything unclean. I'm not about to. And the message then says, what? What God has made is uh, clean. Anything God's made. What I have made, it's all clean. Wait a minute. That, that, that is absolutely contradictory to the Old Testament. Everything that God made was not clean. It could not all be eaten. What does that mean? Was God uh, in conflict with himself? No. God's changed the rules. Can God do that? Sure he can. How many of you were running a computer when you got Microsoft 1.0? It wasn't even labeled 1.0. I had one of those. It had a 10 megabyte hard drive. 77? Way back. <laughs> okay, well then you get DOS 2.0. Is DOS 2.0 the same as 1.0? No. no. How about 3.0? And then you got Windows. Wow, Windows. Then you got Windows 95. And then you got, well, what all, you know, it went through. Did God change the rules? Yes. The Old Testament had a different set of rules. What were the rules on the Old Testament law? Well, there were a whole bunch of them. We don't have time to talk about them all. But part of the law was there were certain things you could eat and certain things you can't eat. What things under as Christians can we not eat? Can you eat catfish? Yes. Jews couldn't. Why can we? Can we eat pigs? Yes, we can, except for Shelby. Shelby can't eat pigs. That's because she grew up in Texas and thinks all barbecue should be from a cow. <clears throat> I grew up like that. Eventually, I backslid. <laughs> and now I accept that barbecue can be both cow and pig. <clears throat> yeah, well, don't push it. Um, the rules changed. So there was no. we're not going to Jerusalem anymore. We're not going to offer sacrifices anymore. We're not going to have priests anymore. Wait, we are going to have priests. Who are they? Christians. Raise your hand in here if you've been baptized and are a Christian. You're a priest. You're a priest to God. Priests have the right to go directly to God. All of us, Paul, Peter said, we are God's priests. Jesus is our high priest through whom we go to. Can we go to God and carry the sacrifice for sin like the, like the uh, Day of Atonement in the Old Testament? No, we cannot. Why not? We're priests. Only the high priest could do that. So even under the new law, there is still a high priest and there are priests and we are priests and we offer sacrifices. And the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, what are the sacrifices that we offer? The fruit of our lips includes the sacrifices that we offer to God. When we come together to sing and worship and pray, what are we doing? We're offering sacrifices to God, just like the people in the Old Testament did. This is God's plan. We are priests offering sacrifices, and we participate in it. Okay, get out of the weeds. Let's get back on the path. We have a new plan, and the new plan is... There's going to be a resurrection from the dead, and we are going to have Jesus, who is our high priest, who has made the sacrifice, and now all of these things are going to be where they are. And those who are Corinthians, who have, are Gentiles, and they didn't know anything about Jesus, they didn't know anything about God, they have to learn quickly about God. 
the Jews who became Christians Who become Christians? Okay, that's going to be too long. Let's go here. Um, they are going to have all of the Old Testament knowledge, and then they are going to, as it gets um, written, they're going to have new information, which eventually this is going to coalesce into what we call the New Testament, but it hadn't been written yet, the Bible, the New Testament scriptures, have not yet been written, but they're going to be. So we're in this interesting transmission time, I mean transitional time. The Old Testament things are diminishing, going away. The New Testament things are increasing, they are growing. But there's an overlap right in here where we've got some of both. The Jews are still practicing Judaism. Jerusalem still got sacrifices going on. Are they valid? Are they supposed to be happening? No, but they still are. The Apostle Paul will go to Jerusalem and he will have, he and some of his people who he's with, ceremonially cleansed so they could go to the temple. Good idea or not? There are some who say Paul miscued right there and shouldn't have been involved in that at all. Nonetheless, he did. This is going away. This is growing. Here's the work of the Holy Spirit, which will eventually end in the written New Testament scriptures. And when that occurs, when the Holy Spirit has guided these people into all, all truth, then there's no need for the active, miraculous Holy Spirit anymore. Now the words of the Holy Spirit are written. This is the work of the Holy Spirit continuing in our lives. Does the Holy Spirit still speak to us? No. Through the word. Just through the word. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Where do those words come from? Me or the Holy Spirit? I didn't write them. I didn't have that knowledge. I didn't create it. Paul didn't create it. Where did that information come from? Holy Spirit. Paul says, it's not my gospel. It's God's gospel. It's not my words. It's God's words. And God chose through the foolishness of the message preached. The preaching of this message is what's going to save these people. All right, so we're in this preaching. We are now reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They didn't have 1 Corinthians 15 until Paul wrote it to them. So they are brand new learning this. Long answer to your question, Cecil. Why were they having trouble? Because it's brand new for them. It's not for us. We've been around it forever. Okay? Ron. Wasn't Paul working totally on hearsay? Y'all be nice to Ron. He's missed a few weeks. <laughs> we spent the last three weeks talking about that. Okay. No, Paul says he met Jesus face to face, and he did in Acts chapter 9. And he had met Jesus additionally face to face, I believe, for a period of about two, three years that occurred after that. So no, his information is not hearsay. But he was not a witness to the resurrection. No one was a witness to the resurrection. But there were witnesses of Jesus coming back. Yes, and Paul's in that group. Yeah. No one was a witness of the resurrection act. They were witnesses of what followed in Jesus' resurrection. Okay? Understand that? No one watched him come out of the grave. They saw him after he was out of the grave. Now, actually, uh, John chapter 11, who watched the resurrection of Lazarus? Everybody. Everybody was there. Whoever was in that town watched it. Nobody watched the resurrection of Lazarus either. They weren't in that room when he came back to life. They watched him when he walked out. 
in their estimation that his resurrection was when he walked out. Yeah. He was laying down, he was dead. He came to life, got up, walked out, still bound out of the cave, where the burial where he was. Who watched him come to life? No one watched him come to life, but they saw him immediately after. Well, before they rolled the stone back, they said, don't do it because there will be a bad odor. The yeah. Bible doesn't say anything about any kind of odor when that stone was rolled away. So was he already resurrected? No. He was in there stinking. <laughs> God turned him from a stinking body to a living body. Nobody saw it, but it happened. She wasn't stinking. She died. That's right. Jesus raised a few people from the dead too. So there were some witnesses of certain people coming back from the dead, but no one saw Jesus actually rise up they saw him after the fact now does it make any difference that we didn't see him actually rise up off the stone you nope. doesn't matter a bit doesn't matter a bit if then if he is walking around then what happened he came back to life and got up okay so if Christ has preached that he's been raised from the dead has Christ been preached that he's been raised from the dead? Yeah, that's what Paul spends the first three verses about. I preached that he's been raised from the dead. Was, in fact, Jesus raised from the dead? Yes, that's what he spends the next eight verses talking about. All the people who saw him raised from the dead. So, did it, was he raised from the dead? Absolutely. Was, is this what we preach? Absolutely. All right. Is this what you believed? Yeah, you did. This is what you said you believed. When you say, before you're baptized... I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Or perhaps someone asked you, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. And Paul will say in Romans chapter 10, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That statement is an important part of our obedience. Nobody can be properly baptized until they acknowledge they believe Jesus is God's risen Son. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Several years ago, we are not getting out of this verse if I start this story. <laughs> Several years ago, I got, I have, what's the proper phrase? I have assisted in a number of people satisfying their consciences that they have been properly baptized. Sometimes that occurs because someone will call me and say, or we talk together and say, you know, I was about 10 years old when I was baptized, and I'm not really sure that I knew what was going on. You know, some of my friends were doing it, and I just did it. I don't really know why. And now as they're pondering it later, they're going, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't know for a fact that I had this in my mind when I was baptized. And, that's, and they said, I want to make it right. It's real easy to do. How do you do it? Go find you some water and baptize them. Now, what are we doing? Are we baptizing them for the first time or baptizing them for the second time? Don't answer that question. In Acts chapter 19, Paul runs into a bunch of folks in, in Ephesus. And he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you've been baptized? And they say, what Holy Spirit? We don't know what you're talking about. Paul says, you don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know anything about the Holy Spirit? Nope. Well, then how in the world were you baptized? We're baptized in the baptism of John. Oh. John baptized for the remission of sins. But that wasn't the final deal. There's a baptism 2.0 and you need it. You, you got 1.0 and you need 2.0. You need an upgrade. And so Paul baptizes them in the name of Jesus. Now, hmm, were they believers? Yes, they were. Were they following God? Yes, they were. Had they been baptized? Yes, they were. Were they Christians? Mm, not exactly. They weren't there. The son, they were on the process. They were, they were, they were on the way, but they, they weren't there. 
Why did Paul baptize them again? Did he baptize them again? Well, he baptized them. John had baptized them. You put terminology however you want. They weren't where they needed to be yet. And Paul says, you're not there. you got to do this. All right, so I've had people who said, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know where I am. I, I don't know what I, I know that I was baptized. I know, you know, but I don't really remember. This, and I've had lots of those. Different scenarios with each of them, but basically the same thing. Sometimes it's just, you know, I don't, I don't remember what I was thinking. I was just so young. I'm not sure I understood, and now I understand so much more, and I really want to make sure. And I baptize every one of them when that happens. This phone call, the guy says, can I meet you to church, Billy? Yep. So I made him. And uh, we get to talking. He said, I want you to baptize me. Okay? Why? Right. This guy's been a deacon in the church for years. And uh, he said, I'm not sure I'm okay. I said, why not? He said, well, I've got some questions about how it happened. You know, what was going on, when it happened. I said, were you baptized in water? Immersed? Yes. Did you believe in Jesus? Yes. You know what his hang-up was? He said, I'm not sure that I've made proper confession. I'm not certain that I confessed the name of Jesus before I was baptized. He said, I am not willing to go into judgment not knowing whether I have actually done what God wanted me to do. I said, okay, let's fix that. We got up in the water, into baptistry. And I said, y'all will never meet him. Joe, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, risen and living at the right hand? He said, yes. I started. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, what? He said, I want to say with my own mouth. I said, okay. What do you want to say? He said, I want to say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, sent to save the world, and that He died and was raised again and is living with God. All right. I heard you say it. You ready now? Ready now. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. And I baptized him. And he went on his way rejoicing. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch did. Because he knew he had done what God wanted him to do. All right. These Christians here in Jerusalem, I mean, excuse me, Christians here in Corinth, when Paul preached to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, what did he do? He baptized them. Are you sure he baptized them? I'm positive he baptized them. How do you know he baptized them? Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I didn't come to baptize, I came to preach. And I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you except for the household of Stephanus. Yes, Paul did not personally do the baptizing of them, and it's a good thing because they all then turned to become followers of, I'm a follower of Paul or I'm a follower of Peter. So Paul says, I'm glad I didn't actually do it, but every one of you were baptized, and you were baptized for the remission of sins, and you were baptized by being immersed in water, and they were baptized after confessing. What did they confess? That they believed Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and what goes along with the preaching and teaching of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. That he was taken by the Jews, by lawless hands, was crucified, was buried, and then was raised from the dead, where he was seen by a whole bunch of folks, and then in Acts chapter 1, ascended back up into the heavens. And then that, from that point on, the preaching of that message went out. So Paul says, if Christ was preached that, you've been, that he was raised, and you've accepted it, how can you now say there is no resurrection from the dead? What they're denying is the possibility of resurrection. Their worldly views have taken back over. These aren't Jews who are having trouble. That happens in Hebrews. These are 
uh, Gentiles who were having trouble, who are now saying, you know, this whole raising risen from the dead thing, you know, we're, we're not just, we're not believing it anymore. So Paul's going to say, you can't be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. And that's where we're going over the next Two years. period of time. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and comments. And we'll be dismissed.